All right, it's just about 12. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Welcome to our first ever uh, live event, Town Hall. Um, I'm going, everybody is muted except for me to begin. I'm going to unmute our news editor. Can you hear me all right? All right. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, great. So we've got sound. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I just am very excited to see this many people on our first ever call. Um, I'm Pamela Steele. I'm the managing editor for Metroland's newspapers and websites in uh, Perry Sound and Muskoka and Dalmaguen, uh, touching the top of, or the bottom of North Bay. Um, and our web, our newspapers are the Huntsville Forester, the Bracebridge Examiner, the Gravenhurst Banner, the North Bay Nipissing News, that's the website, Almaguen News, uh, Perry Sound North Star. Uh, so we have perrysound.com, northbaynipissingnews.com, northbaynipissing.com, and muskokaregion.com. Um, and what we're hoping to do here, one of the, one of the pluses, there have been some pluses of this pandemic, but one of the pluses is that we've discovered that people um, are really good at Zoom calls. Uh, so it gives us the opportunity to come out from behind our keyboards because we're print journalists um, and, and, and talk to you face to face. So we're really excited about that and thank you for joining us to make that happen. Um, we decided our first town hall would be on the tiny homes movement. Um, and our second one is going to be on the housing crisis because uh, they're connected. And certainly um, the housing crisis uh, has been intensified by the pandemic and has never been more, um, more of, a, of a threat to our residents um, as folks are becoming unhoused. Uh, and tiny homes may be an answer to that. We know that we've been in a state of emergency in terms of housing for years in our regions um, and, uh, and, and, and now more so than ever. So maybe this is, this is one of the answers. I think it's gonna have to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, one of the questions is, are our municipalities and, and our government at all levels prepared to support something like tiny homes, particularly in our regions where folks very much wanna have um, uh, the folk, okay. How to put this, uh, we have watched year after year after year after year, we see folks coming to our municipalities with, uh, with solutions to densification to provide attainable housing. Um, and, and pretty much always you have a bunch of folks there who already live nearby who say, no, not in my backyard, we're not gonna have this. So there's a, there's, there's a resistance certainly in our regions to densification. So our municipalities have to be prepared to, to support smaller lots and, and maybe having tiny homes on existing lots as well as the house that lives there. So are they ready to do that? That's one of our questions. Um, we had hoped that, that um, a, a Huntsville councillor uh, Mr. Weeb, who is uh, is a real proponent and has been been helping Huntsville Council to to move forward with this concept, would be with us today. But he, in the end, was not able to. We do have a lot of interesting people here, though. We've got thirty participants so far. Um, what I'm going to do is is first speak to to folks who did tell us that they that they would come. Um, Sarah Law. Sarah Law, let's start with you. Sarah is a journalist covering primarily Gravenhurst. She did a great story on, um, on, on the tiny house movement in Huntsville though. And um, Sarah, do you wanna speak for a moment? And then do you see, um, I'm moving you. Do you see Sarah, the people that you invited here? Um, yeah, I see Cheryl McMillan there, and she's a huge proponent of the tiny house movement, um, and she's one of the leaders of the, the Facebook group to legalize tiny homes and houses in the Muskoka area. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been with the newspaper for about two years, and I've been learning more about the housing crisis and how it's affected so many people in the region and how 
it's interconnected with so many other social issues here. And so looking at tiny homes as a possible solution to that has been really interesting and I'm really eager to learn more about it. So maybe Cheryl, do you want to speak to your knowledge and expertise about this? Okay, Cheryl McMillan, right? I'm unmuting you, Cheryl. Hi everyone, it's good to see you here. Uh, so I'm one of the leaders of the Legalized Tiny Houses in Muskoka group. I haven't been very present on the page recently. I do apologize. I've had some health issues, but I'm starting to feel much better. Um, so our interest, we're a group of like-minded individuals, and we've discovered there are so many reasons why tiny homes make sense. So we started a Facebook group to get the word out and to connect people together. Some people are in the group because they would like a tiny, affordable home for themselves. Some people are thinking about retiring and are ready to sell their regular homes and downsize into something. Some people are environmentalists and they'd like to just have a lighter footprint on the earth and are interested in some of the new technologies that go along with tiny houses to have net zero living. So the amount of energy they're able to generate on their tiny home is equal to what they would consume and that varies depending on the season. Um, there are people who are interested in it from uh, wanting to become a landlord standpoint and to be able to have their own potentially precarious housing situation um, by not quite being able to make their bills stabilized by having a rental income source. We have people who want to travel and they love the idea of a tiny home on wheels and being able to take their work with them and to live in different areas and depending on seasonality and be able to be closer to other family members and things. Um, we have some people that are just purely in it for kind of an altruistic, hey, let's make this happen and help as many people as possible. There's some people that are proponents of communities that are organized with land shares. Um, there's proponents for communities that are organized like a condo association. So have everything you need in your tiny home and not have to deal with yard work. There's people that love the idea of a community where there's shared gardens and things. So our, our mandate as a group is to sort of um, gather people together and as projects come up, be able to link people with the right skill sets so that they can advance their projects forward to support some of the initiatives that are already happening at the municipal level. And also we realize there's some involvement that needs to happen at a provincial level because Ontario does not currently have a designation for tiny homes on wheels distinct from recreational vehicles. Personally, I, um, I own a travel trailer. We spend up to six months a year living in it with our family of five to seven. I've also lived in 175 square feet for two years and they were both quite satisfying experiences. So I have some personal um, experience as well. So this can be a great bet for singles, for couples and for families. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I, I, I put the link to Cheryl's Facebook page in the comments. Um, I, I recommend you go to it. I was there today. And it's extremely lively. Uh, lots of folks sharing a lot of information. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Bissonette now. She's a reporter for our Perry Sound North Star. Sarah, hi. Hello. Um, so in the Perry Sound side, um, and Graham can probably speak to this more than me, um, there is a housing crisis, and but there's a little bit of a chatter going on about um, uh, tiny homes and alternative housing situations. A lot of the focus to date has been um, granny suites and that kind of thing. But uh, the, I know that our former economic development officer for the West Prairie Sound region did speak to tiny homes a as a solution um, if we could get the province and everyone on board and, and, and the land for it. Similar to what uh, motor homes were back, I guess, in the 70s. Um, there was a couple in the uh, McKellar area who created a tiny home in their in a in a in a former school bus and that ge generated a lot of buzz with a lot of people um, interested in, in what they were doing and they were doing that because they were nomadic in the sense where they lived um, in BC part of the time and with family roots in in McKellar area so they uh, they like the ability to travel and, and not be tied down to one place with their work and their family connections. Um, is there anything else that you would like me to speak to, Pam? Um, well, I just wanted you to introduce Graham. So I think Graham yeah. office. All you. 
I'm have? here. Sorry, for some, I have no idea why my video is not working, or at least I can't see myself. I don't know if you can see me. Um, but hopefully my audio is working. It is, Graham. We you can, can hear, hear me. All right, so um, thank you for hosting this. Uh, it's It's been a conversation um, that has been going on in rural municipalities and, and even in the GTA for decades now. Um, and we as, as architects and as construction managers and uh, my our company, Altius, we've been uh, making CSA prefabricated modular homes uh, going on 15 or 20 years now. Um, we do them in very specific circumstances. Um, a lot of island projects, a lot of uh, sleeping cabins and bunkies. Um, and we, we have numerous times looked at the possibility of doing tiny home developments um, and certainly it's not for a lack of the consumers wanting them um, but the one big thing that we face is the regulatory hurdles um, and the financial aspects of, of trying to make this work um, and so I'll, I'll start by saying there there are places within Ontario where tiny homes exist um, we, we call them condominiums, uh, apartments, um, and ultimately the, the, the big invention of the tiny home um, is the trailer park. Um, and those are all uh, legal um, constructs and development constructs that allows people to live in small living spaces. Um, but the kind of tiny homes that we all envision those are almost impossible to do. And, it, and it's the big problem we face, um, not only from a, a, a municipal zoning bylaw aspect, but also things like the Ontario Building Code. Um, so a lot of, and I, and I, I think the media um, and you know, magazines that will not be not be mentioned um, have done a, a, a real disservice to the consumer because so many of the tiny homes that we see um, are they're they're home built. They're they're built by the occupant, um, but for the most part, they're completely illegal. Um, the, all the municipalities within Muskoka will not allow you to park a CSA Z uh, two th or two eleven mobile home and live in it on any piece of residential property within the district um and there's sure, a Grant. you're you're saying that is the case across our region absolutely absolutely um in, in fact the if you look in like township of muskoka lakes and seguin township they actually have definitions of what a mobile home is um and then proceed to say you can't live in one um, the only place that you can live in one would be a designated tent and trailer park. Um, and then the difficulty with the tent and trailer parks is, is that when anybody comes along and says, hey, we're going to redevelop this and we're going to create an opportunity to sell units within the park, inevitably the kind of nimbyism comes out and the MLA gets involved and friends of Muskoka get involved and all of a sudden you're you're facing you know six seven figure legal bills trying to establish what would be a tiny home community so it it's always bothered me I I, I there are uh, zoning bylaws um, the township of the archipelago for example is one of my favorite places to work because providing you only have one residence, and that would be the, the building that has a kitchen in it, you can have as many outbuildings as you have coverage for. So you could have, you know, five sleeping cabins and, and a, you know, one cottage that has a kitchen in it. But none of those sleeping cabins can have kitchens in them. Um, so you could never live in one because you, you know, you can't feed yourself. Um, and, but in Township of Muskoka Lakes and Seguin and Halliburton and Algonquin Highlands, it's typically one cottage or one residence and one guest cabin or sleeping cabin or bunkie, whatever they want to call it. And those are generally your tiny homes. They're the 650 square feet and, and under. Um, but they can't have cooking facilities in them. And the reason municipalities do that is because they don't want to create the possibility that you have a rental suite 
on your residentially zoned property. So all of the municipalities discourage the possibility of having a, a tiny home on your property. And what drives uh, drives me crazy is that again, township of Muskoka Lakes on some of these properties, I can build like a 20,000 square foot cottage and one 600 square foot sleeping cabin. And that's, that's the great problem facing tiny homes is if you can find a place to build yourself a tiny home and hide it away from your neighbors so that nobody calls bylaw enforcement off uh, on you, then you're good to go. Um, but if you're actually proposing to do a tiny home, I can, most municipalities also have a minimum size that you can build as your primary residence. And that's normally 800 to 1,000 square feet, which is generally larger than any of us would consider a tiny home to be. 1,000 square feet is, is pretty big. Um, so you, you face that if, if, you, if I have a piece of property and I want to put a 500 square foot tiny home on it, I could go to the municipality and I could ask for a minor variance and they would probably grant it to me. But the next difficulty we have, and, and this is something again where I, I, will, I will blame the media, is that they, they've always presented tiny homes as if this is an affordable way of living. And yes, tiny homes are affordable because, well, they're just that, they're tiny. Um, but when we're building a modular home and, and something like our, our solo, uh, which is a 480 square foot Z240 OBC compliant year round modular home, um, you're packing a lot of really expensive stuff into a very small space. So your kitchens, your bathrooms, your mechanical system, um, and you have to comply with the Ontario building code. So these have to be fully insulated, fully serviced. They need, and then this is where it all goes horribly wrong, is it's one thing to have a, a kitchen and say, okay, I need to spread the cost of my kitchen over 50 square feet instead of the cost of my kitchen over 500 square feet. And I always use the adage of the of the 1500 dollar GE fridge and the $15,000 sub-zero fridge. They occupy the same square footage, but they have a thousand percent budget spread on them. So you, you have your tiny home, which is in and of itself, if it's functional, is going to be quite expensive on a per square foot basis. And that's something that consumers often aren't prepared for. Um, but then when you put it on a piece of property, you've got all of the servicing and infrastructural uh, costs that are exactly the same as they would be for a large scale home. So there's a minimum size that I can do a septic system in any district and through the Muskokas. Um, and that's a you know, 6,000 liter tank and a, a, a single pod septic bed, typically about $25,000. Hey, I have Graham, to have- can I, yeah. can I, sorry, can I ask you a question? So what do you think, what would it cost then to do a tiny home? provided that the municipality would allow you to do it. What are you looking at in, in well, our region? You've got the cost of the home itself. Um, and you're probably looking at a bare minimum of about $300 a square foot. Um, for So, you know, 500 square foot home, $150,000. And, and remembering that the competitive market for this, um, as Cheryl pointed out, is travel trailers. Travel trailers are specifically... Um, not meant for year round living. In fact, you, you you really, really struggle if you bought a Z241 travel trailer or, or um, you know, a, a, a side by side uh, to live in that when it's negative 25 out. It's, it's not healthy. It's not just, it's, it's generally just not safe. So once you bring it up to OBC compliance, and that's where all of a sudden you, you have to have potable water supply, you have to have your electrical connections, you have to have your septic connections, you have to have a driveway. Um, and all of this makes it really expensive. What, what we need municipalities to do is go, let's take a residential zoning and allow for multiple occupants to live on a single property. I would, I would love it if I could buy a piece of property, put six one-bedroom homes on it, and have all six of those one-bedroom homes connected to one septic system. 
and one electrical supply and one propane supply. If you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I might be offending people with the propane supply, but it's kind of a necessity when the power goes out. Um, but uh, so you, you actually need to change the zoning if you're ever going to make tiny homes a legal, be saleable. Because right now, if you built a tiny home, you can't sell it because they're not legal. Um, and, and if they are legal, they're going to be expensive. Um, and that kind of defeats the point of the affordable housing. Um, so if, if you, you know, nobody, if we were, uh, you know, and I, I'm going to come to the GTA and, and into Toronto, when Toronto talks about affordable housing, they're talking about high rise apartment buildings and what high rise apartment buildings have in common, um, is that they all share the infrastructure. Um, every single unit in that shares everything from garbage collection to snow removal. And so you, you have to figure out a way to do that with tiny homes because otherwise just the cost of purchasing the land normally puts the price out of reach for anybody who's considering a tiny home. Um, so what about, Graham, we've got people in the chat asking about tiny homes um, hooked up in town so that so that they could hook up to town services. You, you can, but you, you still have the problem of the only difference in cost in town is the cost of the home itself. Mm -hmm. The cost of putting that home on that property, paying the taxes on that property, paying the municipal services on that property are exactly the same for a tiny home as they are for a five bedroom home. Mm -hmm. So, it there there you don't have the economy of scale to make a tiny home affordable because the zoning and the 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 laws of property own, ownership and taxation um, in this province just don't permit it. Um, okay. And and we look south of the border and we see all these wonderful tiny homes that Americans have made and and then you, then you go. Oh yeah, and they're they're in unregulated communities in in you know northern New Hampshire kind of thing. <laughs> they, there are no rules, so they don't have to follow them. Unfortunately, you've got to go pretty far north in this province to get into an unre unregulated community. Okay, hey, Graham, I, I'm gonna uh, go to Cheryl for a minute now. Cheryl, uh, did I unmute you? Unmute. I'm having a problem unmuting Cheryl. Sorry, Cheryl. Yeah, hey, I was able to do it on my end. <laughs> um, I would argue a little bit against that last assertion. Just the, the average purchase price for a home in Muskoka is $600,000. And when we can get high-end, tiny home units built for about seventy to 130000 half a million is still a big difference. But yeah, and, and I think the densification within towns it makes sense because it offers additional taxation collection for the town. You don't have to really change your infrastructure that much. We already have sewer. We already have water. We don't have the problems with a septic system that can't handle a number of additional toilets being added to it. Um, we also have additional permits being built. And in Gravenhurst and in Huntsville, there is not a minimum square footage restriction. There is in Bracebridge and there is in most of the rest of Muskoka, but you are allowed to build quite small with an appropriate building permit with everything done according to uh, the laws that we have there. So we're not talking about tiny homes on wheels, but tiny homes on foundation are possible in Huntsville and in Gravenhurst. In Huntsville. Uh, that's three dwelling units. That's where it gets a little bit difficult because it has to be a granny flat in Huntsville. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Gravenhurst. One of our other members of our leadership team is investigating more of the details in Gravenhurst for adding additional units beyond a primary home that is more traditionally sized. Okay, thank you for that, Cheryl. Um, I do want to, Graham, we'll go back to you, but I do want to, um, uh, from Almaglin, we had thought that we might see from um, Monica or Louise Moffat. Monica or Louise, can you put your hand up if you're on the call? Monica or Louise? I just don't want you to have been invited and not able to speak. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, if you are here, do let me know. 
Um, what I'm going to do now is, is uh, we've got about 20 minutes left, so I want people to have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I will remind you that, that the, the, our rules of engagement are that we are going to be kind and polite at all times. So if I, if I do um, unmute you and then uh, um, uh, trouble ensues, then I will remute you. Uh, so let's be kind. Um, so I, I saw Toronto 1969. I saw your hand up. So I'm going to find you and unmute you. There you are. Okay, hopefully this works. Hi, can you introduce yourself? I wanted to make a comment in regard to the uh, limitation of a uh, six tiny house on one property. Uh, my information is 12. There is a limit of 10,000 liters before you need to apply and get some rental assessment. Now, my unit that I use is called the Bio, uh, Waterloo Bio System. Now that system provides for 12 units, one system, for 12 units connected to one system, 12. Provided, it's for two people and no more. So a tiny house for a couple is legally entitled uh, to go the maximum of 10,000 liters by one bio water loop biofilter system. The most now are, you, are you living in a tiny house now? Uh, I have a water loop bio system I have lived in a tiny house for two or three months at a time in the past, in a Volkswagen van for a couple of months at a time, but otherwise I am not living in a tiny house. I am one of the founding members of this whole tiny house group. I am the one that basically did everything to get this thing off the ground. And we had 12 members and we've had 12 founding members, so roughly, at our first meeting in November. I'm the one that, you know, was driven to do this, driven. And I will retire when we have a thousand members. I'll retire. And I'm sorry, what was your name? Uh, Mark Bokelman. Oh, hi, Mark. And you're, you're here in Perry Sound, Muskoka. Uh, I am in um, Huntsville. I have a home. Uh, I am from Toronto. I have a second home in Huntsville in Hidden Valley. Okay. All right. And and you you started you started I, this group. I was I was driven to start this group. Which which header 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 from the uh, Table Foundation. We've mm -hmm. talked about it for years and we finally figured let's do it. Is Heather with us today? Does anybody see Heather? Um, I don't know. Heather is, uh, has a lot on her plate, okay? <laughs> That's true. That is Heather. true. Well, thank you for being here with yeah. us, Mark. Oh, yeah. um, Three, 12 houses on one land. You can have a condominium form, just like any other condominium form. You can have a co-op form, like any other co-op, or you can have, uh, what is it called, uh, community trust housing form. These are three legal forms, they're legal in Canada. What's not legal, that you can put 12 on one property. That's not legal. But otherwise, that is the economic way to go. That's the lowest cost. The services are the same services as any other little suburb. But when you do one house on one property, the cost goes up. But when you already have a property like me, I can build a tiny house on my property and I already have the services. Everything is here. It's already paid for. Plug it in and I rent it out and make more money or I give it, I rent it out by the month. So the existing properties is called legally, an, what is it called? A, an additional, I, know, I have three, I forgot, but I wrote, I wrote a, I got it in my thing, but I forgot. You can have an additional tiny home on your property then that cost is less you already paid for it so mark is the town of huntsville allowing you to do that now excuse me again you're in the town of huntsville is the are you allowed to do that in huntsville at this time yes yes my understanding is 
that is legal to build a tiny house in Huntsville because they have decided to get do away with the minimum square footage that you're allowed. That's all. And they have interpreted the building code in a, how would I say it, the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. And they have interpreted that you can build 188 square feet as per the recommendations of the provincial government. But what the provincial government does not do, they do not make it legal in all the 430 municipalities. They leave it up to the municipalities to decide what they want to do. Hospital decided to, to do away with minimum square footage. And the province has legalized only a year ago that I can have two units in my house, which I do, and if I want to, I can build a tiny house right on my property, which I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Legal in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Now, does anybody would would I'm I'm I know that Celia is on the phone from Almagwin. I wonder if Celia wants to speak up now and i'm not sure which is your phone number so we're going to go to our phones and just see hello caller is this celia i'm unmuting all the phone calls phone callers hi is celia there i guess she's not um do i i have three people on the telephones we know in paris muskoka connectivity is a problem so we wanted folks who didn't have it to be able to talk. Does anybody on these uh, on these phone calls want to ask a question of anyone? Okay. Does anyone know about the Arcadia off-grid community? We had thought that we were going to have Monica here from Arcadia today, but she didn't come. Does anybody else, can anybody else speak to Arcadia? I'm sorry, we are not able to at this time. Um, but but can you um, what? Oh, Sarah Bisnet, Sarah can speak to it perhaps. I just want to. I just need to find you. We have forty people on our call, which is pretty exciting. Okay, Sarah. Ah, I'm just pointing out that Graham has said that he can respond to some of the points. Um, yes, I'm not sure Sarah. if that's our key directly, but um. But Graham is able to speak, he said. Okay, all right. So we have had some questions in the chat. Um, Mark mentioned three models for a group of tiny houses on a single property. And so can a rural resident buy a tiny home on a property and legally tie into the same water and septic service that is already there. So going to Graham for comments. I, sorry, I because I have no video, I can't wave at you and say, <laughs> please, please put me back on. Um, there are some very interesting points about this, about uh, typically when we look at residential zoning bylaws um, or municipal zoning bylaws, they, they are all kind of templated from one another. Um, so they, they classify homes as, you know, single family detached homes, duplexes, triplexes, apartments, and condominiums. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that, that you know, apartments, condominiums, and co-ops are just versions of themselves. They're more legal entities than anything else. Um, and so what my friend from, from Huntsville was saying about uh, uh, Waterloo biof biofilters, fantastic systems. Um, they're, they're one of the most efficient septic systems going, um, and they do allow for a lot more effluent um, on a on a normal septic bed. Um, they are expensive, but they're they're exceptional. Um, and um, but when we talk about um, accessory units or granny flats, so the the term that most people use is accessory dwelling unit. Um, and that accessory dwelling unit, the important part of that is the dwelling part. And, and that is where you, that secondary um, dwelling on your property, whether it's kind of attached or it's in your backyard or your front yard or out in a field or whatever, um, that dwelling unit is a, a fully independent living space. It has a kitchen, it has a bathroom, somebody can live there, you can rent it out. Um, when you 
build something like that on your property, the one thing that's tricky to do though is you can't sell it um, because it's part of your property. You can lease it, you can rent it, um, but if you want to say put three, um, uh, three tiny homes on a single property. Um, there are agreements that buyers can do where they can, they can come together and buy the property, all three units. Um, or uh, there's something called a vacant land condominium. Um, and I think it's actually probably the best model if somebody was actually wanting to do a tiny home development, buy a piece of property and put multiple homes on the property and be able to sell them and be able to have the people who buy them obtain normal mortgages and things like that. So um, my friend did mention a co-op. Um, the one big, co-ops are wonderful. Uh, the one big problem is, is that you can't get a mortgage on a co-op because you don't actually own your own unit. You own a share in a building, um, like you would own a share in a company. Um, so you can't mortgage that share. A condominium um, actually allows you to own your unit and then everything outside of your unit that isn't somebody else's unit is a common element. So the vacant land con condominium behaves a lot like a like a normal big condominium in the city um whereas you know if say you've got a couple of acres of land and you've got you know 10 tiny homes on it you would own the postage stamp of land under your tiny home and you would own your tiny home itself but all of the other elements on the property driveways septic systems sewage connections everything is a common element and those common elements would be paid for like anybody else who has a condominium. You have a common element fee um, and you have a condominium board, which is made up of the, of the, you know, the people who live in the community normally. Um, and you manage your common elements um, and the maintenance of those common elements um, like any other condominium would. So that, that is, in my opinion, is, is the most affordable way to create um, a, uh, a tiny home community. But again, most of the municipalities, they don't have any land that's zoned for that kind of use. The closest thing that they would have would be a commercial resort development. Um, and when commercial resort developments come up, as we've seen, you know, through the, through the district, um, those tend to go to the highest bidders <laughs> and it's not people interested in doing tiny home communities. If you've uh, followed something like legacy call, uh, legacy cottages in Manette or uh, touchstone on, on Lake Muskoka and villas of Muskoka there, most developers aren't interested in producing tiny homes, which kind of leaves it to, the municipalities um, to kind of spearhead it or groups like this to spearhead it. Um, but knowing full well, you're, you're, it's a competitive market. Um, and, and again, like, you know, these communities are so viable, but finding the willpower and the expertise and the financing to actually execute one is takes more than willpower. Okay. Thank, thank you, Graham. Um, Mark, I believe you wanted to, you had a follow-up? Yes, one comment. Um, I researched the co-op movement in Canada. There are 10,000 co-ops. Many of these co-ops are co-op residences, and they're in Toronto, they're everywhere, they're townhouses, they're high-rises, and they all are financed. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation has a huge budget to finance co-ops at a much higher percentage than, for example, a bank, which is 75%. So there is room for co-ops, even though, as a re every real estate professional will let you know, that co-ops, the shares of co-ops, do go up. But if a co-op sells for $400,000 and they were bought at two, a similar condo would sell for $800,000, double. So a co-op is much more stable if you are focusing on the need for housing rather than the need for investment or uh, your house becomes your piggyback. I have lots of piggybacks and 
I never knew that there was so much money in my piggy banks because yes. I had more than one property. I have no idea. It just seems to go up and up and up and up, and I have no control over it. And I, I agree. Don't, I don't I, want it to go up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I completely... I completely agree, and but it, I'll play devil's advocate here, and okay. you're absolutely right. There are, there are hundreds of, of co-ops uh, in the city of Toronto. Um, the co-op model was replaced by the condo model, yeah. and, and there hasn't been, in my knowledge, many co-ops built in the last 30 years. They've all been replaced by condos, and to your point that uh, a, a co-op is worth half what a condo is you're absolutely right and that's largely because the market for the co-ops is you you have to pretty much have cash in hand um, to purchase the co-op whereas you can you know leverage yourself to the hilt as so many people are to buy a 500 square foot condo um, so the 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 I, and it's not to say that condo models are bad, um, but the the condo model, if you're if you're assuming that probably a lot of people who want tiny homes, it is an affordability factor, and therefore they do need to be able to mortgage them. The vacant land condominium does become the preferred model for any such development. Thank you, thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Mark. Um, Sue McKenzie, I, I'm I'm unmuting you. You have some good comments there in the chat. Did you want to? Did you want to raise uh, that issue? I believe I have unmuted you. Sue McKenzie, where did you go? Sue McKenzie, there you are. I, I, her question is a very good one about um, resort development. Um, and the, and I, I've sat in on some of these meetings. Um, the, the issue with resort development and if any of us have been around in Muskoka long enough and have, you know, parents and grandparents, I mean, I remember uh, as a three-year-old um, cottaging at the Ross Trevor Resort on Lake Rosso, which were all these tiny little cabins and we'd rent them for a couple of weeks and off we'd go. The problem with those resorts was, and for the people operating them, was that there was no ownership model. You couldn't sell any of the resort you had to own the resort and you had to operate it and you were dependent on the income of operating that resort and that's why frankly they have pretty much have all gone out of business um and uh so the the difficulty with the resort development within the official plan right now is that resort development is supposed to provide a reasonably affordable way for tourists to visit this wonderful district of Muskoka. Um, and what's at issue right now with uh, legacy cottages and particularly villas of Muskoka is that the district is arguing, um, and people like the MLA and, and friends of Muskoka are arguing that what developers are doing is actually using the resort zoning to build subdivisions, and that they're selling these units to people who have no intention of renting them to the general public, and they're not really operating a resort. It, they're, they're really operating a subdivision. Um, and so that's developers taking an opportunity and twisting it around. So the, the, the district and, and, um, and the opponents of this are saying, you know, it's fine if you develop a cottage resort, but every single one of those units has to be available 50% of the time to be rented to the general public. Um, and nobody who buys any of these um, resort properties can declare them as a principal residence. So they have to have a secondary residence somewhere else. Um, and so that's what the huge issue is um, in terms of the current resort development. Um, so to bring up the issue of tiny homes, where we want people to be able to live in these year round, um, and we want people to be able to own them, and they don't necessarily want to rent them out. Um, the resort, commercial resort zoning designation is, it's a double-edged sword because really it's the only way you could build a tiny home development. But at the same time, then the district would turn around and say, well, it can't be your principal residence and you have to make it available to be rented out 50% of the year and at least one month of the summer. Okay, um, Graham, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off because you have one minute left. 
and and I wanted to see if Sue wanted to say something and Mark wanted to say something else. So Sue, Sue, you 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 also seemed to want to talk about the environmental piece. Oh, okay, go. Oh, go. Yes, you're there. You muted me. I'm muted. Yeah. Yeah, I you. My browser was blocking me. What was your question? Did you have a question for us about the environmental? The environmental. The environmental impact. Yeah. I, it's all breaking yeah. up. Um, it is our no, connections bad. Oh, but I, I, I had written to you. Um, of the importance of um, these developments have within uh, the so Unfortunately, uh, your, it's not sorry. working. So uh, I would just, folks, please do have a look in the in the in the chat side there uh, for what Sue had to say. Cheryl, you have. I'm unmuting Cheryl. Unmute. Unmute. Got it. Um, when she was talking about some of the environmental benefits of tiny homes, know that within our Facebook posts, if anybody's looking for more info, we featured some great ones. There's one done by the University of Carleton, or sorry, Carleton University right now, where they have all sorts of sensors in their unit and they're tracking it for a year. They're pulling water out of the air, among other really interesting off grid net zero technologies and capabilities that they're working on. So do look through our group if people are looking for specific information. There are literally probably 50 different posts that all speak to that um, area of things. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, Andrew from Giant, Giant something. Yeah, Giant Containers. We're a, a Canadian modular manufacturer. We use shipping containers as kind of our substrate very similar to Altius. And I'd like to say, like, I completely echo everything that Graham was saying uh, in terms of, um, you know, the shared infrastructure being really the path forward. If zoning can allow for that, be a massive uh, assistance. And then you can maybe even leverage uh, funds from CMHC, like the Rapid Housing Initiative. I, I know Muskoka was looking into that earlier, maybe a resale model that's involved with that. Um, yeah, it's just tons of opportunity. I just kind of wanted to, to introduce our company as an industry consultant, anything you need from our end. Um, I'd love to connect offline on this. I know obviously there's not much time left, but uh, anything you need from our end. Like we've had massive success in the US doing this, but in our own backyard, it just seems to be extremely difficult because of zoning implications and so on. Thank, thank you, Andrew. We are, we are two minutes over now. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to keep going for a few more minutes just to make sure that everybody's had a chance uh, to talk now. Mark, you had something you wanted to respond to? Uh, let somebody else talk. <laughs> okay, Mark, thank I you. Talk enough. <laughs> Mark's talked enough. All right, please do raise your hand if you want to speak before we, before we call it a day. Don Clement, do, do, do you have anything to add to, to where we're at now? I've unmuted you. Are you with us, Don? Okay. I don't think Don has anything to say. Uh, Mark does, though. Mark? Recreational villages are like mushrooms coming out of the ground in the Netherlands, like mushrooms. And they are tiny homes. They build. Developers are building it. Communities are supporting it. Anyone can rent it. You can rent it for a day, for a year, for a month. You can own it and be there all the time. But it's not designated, like we've heard before, as permanent residence. That doesn't mean that people do not live there as permanent residents. They do. My sister has done it for oh, 20 years. And it was a recreational village. There are so many companies. They're spreading all over Europe. They're building tiny house villages. In but that model can also be used in a non-recreational sense. It can. Um, so I'm saying these villages are popping up like mushrooms. And I, in our uh, group, I have posted many of those Dutch villages that look, the architecture is completely the best in the world. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it can be done. They're doing it. And I have featured that on our website or our Facebook site in English translation. I featured it many times. And it's a good model that can be adapted. It doesn't have to be recreational, but it often is. It often is. But they are tiny houses. They're 400 square feet. And uh, I was going to buy one and, uh, you know, spend five or six months in the Netherlands and then Airbnb it for the rest of the time. I was going to do it. And I'm still my do it. And it are 100,000 euros. 100,000 euros. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I've seen these tiny home developments in Detroit, uh, which is all, you know, an amazing city in terms of, of, of rising from the ashes. Um, and, and I've seen an Alzheimer's village uh, as well, uh, which I think is an amazing idea. Now, uh, we do have Don Clement now. Don, you wanted... Oh, you're unmuted, but I don't hear you. Do you have your volume on, Don? Hmm. Okay. Um, do you see beside your beside your microphone, a little arrow that then gives you an option to turn up your volume at all? Still not working, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you, Don. Maybe uh, if you put your comment in the chat, then I, I will tell people what it is. I'm, I'm sorry that it did not work for you that the that we have our volume problem. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, uh, I, have, I have one phone caller. I'm going to unmute you, phone caller. Um, did you, uh, number ending 3366, uh, did you have something to, to add or a question to ask? Well, I was just, inter I was just interested, that's all. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to make sure we acknowledged you. Thank you. Um, okay, folks, we are six minutes over the time that we said that we would have for this chat. I appreciate very much uh, all of you coming here. This is our, our, our first town hall, and I thought if, if five people come, I'm going to be over the moon. Um, and we had at the height of this chat, I think, 38, 40 participants. So I appreciate you coming. We're gonna be having these every Thursday at noon. Um, and our next one next week is very related because it's about the housing crisis. And I can tell you that Metroland is taking on the housing crisis right across Ontario. Our Simcoe um, peers have done a, a, a 50 piece a special investigation into housing in Simcoe. They called it Gimme Shelter. And uh, in my meetings with the editorial group, so it's the editors of the community papers across Ontario. And uh, in our meetings, well, the questions that we're asking and that we want to delve into are, um, who's responsible? We have this huge housing bubble um, and folks, you know, some folks are making a lot of money off of it, but we are seeing people unhoused. And it's, it, it has been traditionally very easy for our governments and folks to ignore folks who are disenfranchised. But now that it's affecting the middle class, now that you have working people out of houses, you've got people with double incomes out of houses. We ourselves had a, a, a reporter have to leave us uh, in, in recent weeks because uh, he and his, his, um, his partner, so two incomes, could not find a place to live in Muskoka when their landlord uh, uh, took back their house. So it's, it's a problem. It's a hu housing is a human right. Uh, we say Canada is the number one country in the world and people in, our, in Ontario are not being able to access their human right to housing. So that's what we're going to look into. <laughs> Thank you for the, 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 the victory sign, Mark. Thank you, everyone. We're going to end it now. We are going to attempt 
to tech willing. We're going to attempt to post this so that you have it. And please do email me at psteel at metroland.com if you have any questions or reach out to one of our reporters. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye, everyone.